Hong Kong, historical juncture of East and West, high octane metropolis of seven and a half million souls, home to more skyscrapers than any other city in the world. This city, like many others, has experienced its fair share of challenges in recent times. But no matter how tough things get, there's something special about Hong Kong that makes you, well, look up. I'm Sam Evans, rider, traveler, and Hong Kong resident, and I want to get to know this city on a deeper level by journeying through its neighborhoods to discover some local gems, grassroots culture, and human stories that make this incredible, resilient city what it is. So join me as we explore. This is Hong Kong Hoods. Over the course of this two-part special, we're going to journey through Sham Shui Po in Western Kowloon, a backwater fishing village turned urban sprawl that became the site of a prisoner of war camp during the Japanese occupation and later suffered a refugee crisis. Sham Shui Po has seen it all. And though not always pleasant, the area's rich history has helped mold it into one of the most fascinating places in the city. The district today is characterized by its maze of market stalls, and echoes of the past resound here in a cacophony of hawker shouts and clattering of second-hand goods. This is a place where vintage is king, but there's new life here too, as low rents have led to an influx of young creatives who have made Sham Shui Po a bohemian hub of the arts and coffee culture. This isn't to say all is well, as the neighborhood remains one of Hong Kong's most deprived. And while she ain't pretty, Sham Shui Po certainly is beautiful. As a traditionally welcoming place to immigrants, home to breathtaking garden culture and some of the best food in the city. Let's begin the first half of our exploration. Hi everybody, welcome to Sham Shui Po. We're gonna start off today at the iconic Apliu Street. And this street has a rather interesting history. Believe it or not, this place actually used to be famous centuries ago for raising ducks. And that's why the name is what it is, because Apliu literally translates as duck coop. There's been a market around here in some form or another for generations, but it wasn't until around the 1930s that it got its current flea market character, when vendors started coming out and selling second-hand goods of many descriptions. Fast forward to the 1980s, and with the advances in technology and Hong Kong's booming economy, this place became known for what it is today, as a mecca of electronics. You dream it up and you can probably find it here. From mobile phones and SIM cards, to wires, to power tools, to household appliances, both modern and retro, even audio equipment, it can all be found here, and usually for significantly cheaper than what you find on the high street. Let's get lost and snag ourselves a bargain. I've just seen that they're practicing Gua Sha at a stall on a street just adjacent to here. Gua Sha is a type of therapy in ancient Chinese medicine where the practitioner scrapes the skin with an object in order to improve circulation and drought impurities. It's quite common in the West these days as a form of new age alternative therapy, uh, but there's nothing new age about this stall. It seems very authentic and very traditional. There seem to be quite a lot of locals gathering around there getting in on the action and I'm eager to see what all the fuss is about, so I'm gonna give it a try. Wish me luck. No more, please. Surrender, surrender. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
Well, no one said keeping healthy was painless. Let's recover with a bite at one of Sham Shui Po's beloved eateries. We just sat down at Sun Herm Yun, and this is a Cha Tan Teng. Cha Tan Teng are a very common institution in Hong Kong. They are basically a Hong Kong style, Western style cafe, if that makes any sense at all. The story behind these Cha Tan Tengs starts in around the 1940s when cafes and restaurants started popping up that would serve Western food as well as Chinese food. And it's thought that they were influenced by the English tea time tradition. The only difference is they're traditionally aimed at the Chinese local customer base. These days, Cha Tha Teng are quite ubiquitous in Hong Kong with one on seemingly every street in the city. This one is relatively famous and these guys are known for supposedly making the best egg and corned beef sandwich in the city. I've ordered one and I can't wait to dig in because I'm starving. So let's take a bite into it and see if it lives up to the hype. That's so good. It's really rich in texture. You kind of got the crumbly squishiness of the beef, the soft bounciness of the egg. You can get this toasted or non-toasted. I recommend it toasted because it just finishes it off with a nice little crunch. Flavors are delicious. That is a brilliant sandwich. Mm. I've still got a little bit of room in my stomach, so let's move on to another foodie favorite in the area. This is Kung Wo Bean Curd Factory, a Hong Kong institution that's been around since 1893, and they've had their main shop here in Sham Shui Po since the 1950s. And as the name is probably gonna reveal, these guys specialize in serving up a range of authentic Hong Kong soy-based dishes. Let's try some. First up, we have Dao Fu Fa, or Silken Tofu Pudding. It's a very popular dish here in Hong Kong, and it's said to make your skin nice and smooth. Uh, now, the pudding on its own isn't all that flavorsome, so it's customary to sprinkle a little bit of sugar on it to bring out that X factor. Mmm, that's so good. You get the savory taste of the tofu first and then the sugar just comes in and gives it a sweet edge at the end. That's incredible. And it's so smooth, it just floats down your throat. You can tell there are a lot of years of technique that have gone into this. Wow, no wonder the famous around here. This is delicious. Next up, we have Daofu Pop, which is deep fried tofu. It's supposed to be crispy on the outside and then smooth and silky on the inside. And to give it a bit of a flavor injection, it's recommended to add a bit of hot sauce. Let's try this. Mm. The crunch and then the bounce is really satisfying. Honestly, it tastes a little bit like a chicken nugget, but somehow feels a lot healthier. Delicious though. Mm. That hit the spot. Now let's go and check out some more of the area's history. In the years after World War II, thousands of Chinese refugees flooded into Sham Shui Po and set up vast networks of squats on the hillsides overlooking the neighborhood. Disaster struck on Christmas Eve 1953, when a fire ripped through the squatter village and left almost 60,000 people homeless. The government responded to this humanitarian crisis by building Shek Kip Mayor State. This represented the birth of Hong Kong's public housing system that today houses around half of all Hong Kongers. In recent years, a couple of venues in this part of town have been revitalized and are now attractions in their own right. Meiho House was one of the original housing blocks built for the displaced refugees, and today it houses a youth hostel and museum that highlights the changing conditions in Hong Kong public housing through the decades. Just down the road and housed in an old neighborhood factory building, the Jockey Club Creative Arts Center provides affordable studios for local artists, some of which are open for the public to check out the beautiful art on offer. To end the first half of our Sham Shui Po tour, we're gonna to meet one of the neighborhood's most intriguing characters. Paul Au is Hong Kong's most famous record collector, owning some 300,000 records, a fair few of which are on sale at his fifth floor apartment cum record shop 
that he moved into after selling records on the street here in Sham Shui Po for 20 years. Arriving here in the mid-1970s to escape the horrors of the Vietnam War, Paul, to me, epitomizes the spirit of Sham Shui Po. As an immigrant that arrived here with nothing, but then followed his passion to achieve a free-spirited success that is very different from the traditional Hong Kong way. The man is waiting for us now, so let's go up and hear his story. <laughs> Hello everybody, I'm Paul. Um, I think I'm a crazy uh, record collector and a music lover here in Hong Kong. And they call me the adoptive uh, parent of uh, the vinyl records. I grew up in Saigon during the 60s and um, until the mid 70s. A lot of American soldiers were there. There were some hippies in there too. So at that time, there were many like uh, long hair Vietnamese CP cover bands. That's how I got to love the rock and roll culture. In 75, I would turn 18 and I would be drafted to the battle. The big boys next door, they were sent to the war and some did not come back. And it won't be long, it's my turn. So I smuggle here to Hong Kong. <laughs> when I first moved to Sham Shui Po, I was always um, going to hunt for records for myself. When it got too many, I started to sell records on the street. At first, I had only like two or three boxes of them. Then uh, they get more and more, it's like a snowball effect. <laughs> it was very hard to move the whole shop back and move the whole shop back to the street. So in the night time, I just uh, cover them uh, nicely and I just um, slept beside the records. It's like cowboys watching the cattle, just like that. It's, it's a lifestyle. But suddenly, if you in the 90s, they, they, they have music on CDs. I was very sad because at that time, nobody wanted the vinyls. They treat them like rubbish. And, and people uh, knew about me on the newspaper. There was this crazy man, he's always uh, on the street. Every afternoon, I received really tons of records from the radio stations, many discotheques, closed down shops, people's homes. I always persuade them not to give up. I say, you bought them very expensively, but now you gave them up. Why? They say, you want them or not? If not, I will send them to the dumb side. So there's nothing I could do. I just have to receive them because I, I really don't want them to die. I have uh, now around like uh, 300,000 records, 30,000 records here, but I have 10 times more in my big storage. I sleep with the records. I, I don't care if um, I have less space to live uh, as long as the records are safe. I'm not rich in money, I'm rich in music. I separate my records by genre. For example, this part is rock music, this part is like a, a soul music, and this part is Chinese music or classical. If people want to find exactly one record, whatever, when I see it, I know if I have it or not. And I know this is a rock part. I will go to the rock part and pull it out. It's very easy. This is my computer here. I have the GPS in here. I know, I know where they are. Nowadays, many young people come here uh, for the vinyls, now they know the truth about the records, the true sound, the lifestyle and the fun and all that. And when I see them, it's like I see myself in my teenager days. I'm 63, but I'm, I'm still living in the 70s, so I, this lifestyle will still go on. I will still be a teenager until I'm 80, 90, if I can live that long. I can still remember the first vinyl that I ever bought. Uh, it was in 1972. It's uh, the same one like this one. Yeah, but that exact one was left in Vietnam, I think, yeah. The theme song for my shop is in this record. This track, Who Will Stop the Rain? Because it's disaster, people are wasting things, destroy the environment, and don't, they don't reuse, you know. My shop is not just for preserving uh, music history, it's also um, like uh, preserving the environment. This planet is our very beautiful home. We cannot go anywhere else. Because moving to Mars is bullshit, you know. <laughs> no, it will never happen. I just want to have more and more vinyl heroes all over the world to save each and every record. Because records are like living beings. Even the artist is gone, they're still living in the records. Long as I remember Stop. Yeah. 
the rain. And that concludes the first half of our Sham Shui Po adventure. Join us in part two as we get hands-on with some of the neighborhood's historical crafts, explore more stellar food and drink spots, and meet the fifth generation owner of one of the oldest shops in the city who makes his living off stopping the rain. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And I'll see you soon in the next Hong Kong Hoods.